Hi, welcome once again to Eye of the Needle, a podcast from Columbia Threadneedle Investments that aims to demystify the world of investing and put a spotlight on the people looking after your money. I'm Mark King, head of EMEA content, and joining me today as co-host is Corinne Walker, Investment Campaigns Manager. Hello, Corinne. Hello. Who's joining us on the pod this time around? Um, this time around, we've got two guests with us again. Um, Philip Deccan, Head of European Equities, joined by European Smaller Companies Portfolio Manager, Mine Tesco. We'll be talking to them about their investment process, the outlook for Europe, and much, much more. Welcome to the podcast, both. Thank, right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, this episode will also feature our ongoing ABC of Investing series, This Month in History, and Three Things to Ask Your IFA This Month. But before we get to that, we're going to head straight into the 60 second challenge in which Phil and Mine have just one minute to explain to listeners about their asset class. <laughs> Phil, you've got European equities and Mine, I believe you are going to talk about smaller companies specifically. Yes. Yeah. So taking you first, Phil, you work in European equities, as we know, but how do you define that asset class? What makes it different from other investment areas? And hopefully you can enlighten us on all that within just 30 seconds. Amina, you will follow straight after Phil. Uh, so are you both ready? Ready to go. Okay, your time starts now. So we invest in public equity markets, which means quoted companies in pan-Europe. And by quoted companies, we mean companies where you can see the share price on a stock exchange. And pan-Europe is UK, continental Europe, and does include uh, central and eastern Europe, though we don't do very much in that area. And we're active managers, which means we invest in the companies we like, not necessarily the ones in the indices, in the stock market index. Um, and we invest in large cap, small cap, income funds um, across the whole range. So as equity investors, we become part owners of these businesses, and there are thousands of companies which we can choose from. In small cap, anything below the largest 300 stocks in pan-Europe is within the investable universe. We're looking to pick companies that will be the large caps of tomorrow, so the leaders in the future. Very well done. That was well under 60 seconds, I believe. 50, 53 yeah. seconds, something like that. Very clear. I loved it. Very good. So let's dive straight into the first part of our chat with Phil and Mine about how they approach the world of investing. So Phil, starting with you, we've just heard you and Mine explain what European equities are, of course, but how do you go about condensing that whole universe into a smaller pool of opportunities that you might be interested in exploring? So we look at the, um, the, the smaller mid-cap universe, which is, as Mine uh, described, everything below the largest 300 companies in Europe, which essentially means if you take the FTSE 100, the biggest stocks in the UK and their equivalent in Europe, they're what we call larger companies and everything else is our universe. And we narrow it down by focusing on the companies that generate the best fundamental returns. So how do the companies that have the highest returns on capital and we tend to steer away from the earlier stage businesses, the, um, the companies that don't have a, a long term track record or companies where we don't feel comfortable that those uh, companies will, will earn that significant uh, return over time. And that you make that sound easy, but there's a huge amount of analysis and research involved in, in that. Uh, that's right. And, it, and, it, and there are certain sectors that we favour over others. So we can find a lot of good smaller companies in the uh, industrial or tech areas where they operate in a small niche, which is too small for the bigger players to get involved in. And what we don't do is that very early stage venture capital type investing where you might be investing in a, in a business or a biotech drug, which may be a blockbuster in 10 years time, but you actually don't have much evidence for that today. So that then narrows it down to a, a more manageable universe. Turning to you, Minnie, can you tell us about your investment philosophy and touch upon what you look for in the businesses you invest in and what your process is? So our investment philosophy is long term and we look for companies that will remain relevant for the world decades from now. Um, in an effort to achieve that, we seek to identify high quality companies, both from a business quality and a management quality perspective. And they will typically have high returns, as Phil said, high profitability and a moat, a competitive advantage that differentiates them. That is hard for anyone else to replicate, which in turn will give them pricing power and allow them to make high returns in the future. And the management teams that we consider ourselves partnering up with, they tend to be uh, capable managers and prudent capital allocators. 
Um, so we tend to invest in businesses with large defensible market shares in their niche and businesses that have pricing power. And in terms of process, we analyze the industry and the company in great detail, then determine a fair value, what we call intrinsic value, uh, for the business with sensible assumptions, and then make a purchase if the market price is meaningfully lower than that. To add to that, Mina, you became uh, manager on the smaller company strategy last year. Have you changed the way you work since then or have you found new ways of working? Well, team collaboration is a big part of our culture here at every level. And we believe that successful portfolio managers are those who always remain analysts. So from that perspective, the way I work hasn't really changed. I work still very closely with Phil and the rest of the equities team, um, European equities team, as well as um, other regional teams and, and our central research folks. Um, but as a manager, I've taken on more responsibility, so I spend more time on portfolio management and positioning, as well as managing the team. So, you know, you obviously mentioned there that you work very closely with the other members in the European equities team. Phil, do you want to talk us through a bit more about the team? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the team uh, in the European uh, market is 10 investment professionals managing funds which are pan-European, so UK and continental Europe, or Europe ex-UK uh, funds, where UK investors can get direct exposure just to the, the, the continent of Europe. And uh, within the team, we are fund managers, but also analysts. So just as Mino described on small cap, people are looking at the stocks, but they're also constructing the funds. And we have freedom within certain tram lines as to what we're allowed to do, but we're, we're very much active managers. So we're looking to buy the stocks we like and we're not too constrained by the index. But we're supported by the UK team, which runs UK only funds. And that's important for our pan-European funds where up to a third of the uh, assets under management might be in UK stocks. And then we have the wider context of uh, the global teams, the US teams, and our colleagues in the US and Singapore who can give context on different parts of the global market, which can have an effect on our, our stocks as well. Uh, Mina, uh, what is it about smaller companies in particular that, that is compelling to you? And are there any challenges that come with that particular area of the market? Oh, absolutely. It's a very compelling universe because the companies tend to be less well known, less well understood by the general investment community. Our focus and research helps us uncover those opportunities. But the challenge is that returns can be very volatile and businesses can become insolvent more easily as they're less diversified and there is little sense of too big to fail. That's why our focus on high quality companies with sustainable business models um, in the space is very important to generate returns. The second major challenge of the small cap universe is reduced liquidity and potentially high trans transaction costs that follow it. Our long-term approach to investing, however, can substantially mitigate this challenge. So as stock pickers, we really tend to like this space. Phil, can you tell us which areas of the market you're finding interesting at the minute? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I think we can find interesting companies in any area of the market uh, with uh, the, the key thing being, is this a company for the long term? Is this a company that can sustainably generate high returns and grow into a bigger company of tomorrow? But there are certain areas where we find that easier. And one area is the industrial or technology space where there are very small niches with companies generating uh, their revenues from either a particular know-how or a particular suite of products or a particular software, which is very applicable to, uh, to their client base, but that might be a very small area that's not very interesting for the bigger players. And I think the, uh, the, the B2B space where companies are selling to other companies is a good area for smaller companies, but they tend not to be so well known. So they're not like the big uh, B2C uh, companies which would dominate tech. Uh, in the US, so the Facebooks of this world, in the Googles. That's not what we're going to find in Europe, but we can find some niche companies that have very strong market positions. And Mina, the, the flip side is, is, of course, that there are some companies that right now and sectors that aren't as interesting to you. Have you got any uh, thoughts on those? Yeah, um, so because we seek to invest in high quality companies that have a competitive advantage, 
The sectors such as commodities and utilities tend to be highly competitive or highly regulated. So in that space, we tend not to find sustainable high return businesses or those that are significantly differentiated from the others. So we tend to be underweight those sectors. So Brexit has been positioned as a British affair, but there'll be effects on European companies. Phil, what are your thoughts on that as we move into 2020? Yeah, it's, well, I think Brexit is a source of uncertainty and certainly has been for the UK market, particularly over the last few years, but it's also a source of opportunity. And uh, one thing that we've seen uh, post the election at the end of last year is that there is a bit more confidence now that with a, a, a stable government with a working majority can move this process forward. And so although we don't know what the end uh, point will be, at least there's a feeling that things are moving forward, that there'll be a pragmatic solution. And therefore, we do see more interest in UK equities uh, in the past few weeks. And uh, and it's probably a bigger effect for the UK market than it is for um, for the European market, given the relative size of each. Um, but it's something we'll be, uh, you know, we'll be keeping an eye on, obviously, very closely. And Mina, I'm sticking with the kind of macro type stuff. Um, is Europe and smaller companies in particular, is it sheltered from the US-China trade war that is ongoing? Uh, Europe is definitely not. Uh, European economy is, is very much in sync with the US and China. Europe is a big exporter to, to both countries. So the effects of the trade war are felt and will continue to be felt in Europe. And the trend of deglobalization can cause business model changes in certain areas. Of course. And technology is huge in the US as well. What does that look like in, in Europe? Can it compete with the US and China on that front? Uh, it can uh, it can absolutely compete in the areas where they operate, but they're not going to compete with Facebook, Google, or the Alibabas of this world. So it's a smaller market, it's a smaller share of the market in Europe, but we do have an overweight in some of these uh, these technology companies. So we, we do find some good ideas here, but they tend not to be the household names. And finally, I mean, uh, um, where do you think we are in the cycle? Uh, is it ever going to end or are we going to be propped up by this low, you know, low interest rates, low inflation, um, low growth, uh, you know, fueled by central bank policy? Is that going to stick around for some time now? Tough question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we are 10 years into a bull cycle in the stock market, so uh, we're certainly not in the early innings. Um, but despite that, because we're still in a relatively low inflation, low growth environment, for the near future, we expect central banks to continue to be supportive. Um, we also hear more discussion on fiscal stimulus from governments. But what's interesting about this cycle is that we've seen technological innovation to be disinflationary um, while increasing productivity. Technology has brought down cost curves in many industries. For instance, in today's world, we can imagine a situation where the marginal cost of energy can be zero in a combination of solar panels and battery storage technology. So you can produce energy from the sun for free and then store it to use for when the sun is not around. We think this technology-led revolution is in the early stages and it will continue to permeate into many industries. And this technology revolution is in scale reminiscent of that of the industrial revolution, but it's happening at a much faster pace. Medium term, um, we need to be cogn cognizant on the potential effects from deglobalization as we were just talking about it and how it will change business models and what that can do to economic growth. Thanks very much, Phil and Minier. Now it's time to move um, on to our exploration of the world of finance with our ABC of investing. That's right, listeners, our attempts to demystify the jargon heavy world of investment goes on. And this episode, we're tackling S, T and U. S is for short selling. This is an investment strategy that speculates on the reduction in the price of a security, such as shares listed on the stock market. It is therefore possible for short sellers to make money when the shares fall. T is for top-down investing, an investment strategy focusing on the larger macroeconomic or market level environmental factors influencing a company when choosing investments, rather than the fundamentals of a potential investment, such as a company's balance sheet. U is for underweight. An investment manager is said to be underweight, an asset class, sector, geographical region, or even a specific security, 
when it represents a lower percentage of their portfolio compared to the index or benchmark. Right then, Mark, let's crack on with part two of our fund manager grilling as we find out more about the faces behind the funds. So, Phil, what made you want to become a fund manager? Well, I've started in the city uh, in investment banking, actually, uh, which is more on the corporate finance and M&A advisory side. And I fairly quickly realized that there was an awful lot of very long hours involved making presentations to clients. <laughs> and uh, this actually wasn't that much fun. And I could see that the people enjoying themselves were on the buy side, as we refer to it. So in investment management, finding out about the companies and then being able to put their money uh, where their mouth is. And I think the combination of the intellectual challenge of finding that next great company with the ability to put money behind that decision uh, was something that really attracted me. And so I moved uh, quite quickly onto uh, the investment side of the business. That does sound more interesting. <laughs> it genuinely is. Yeah, it's like quite rewarding. Yeah. Um, Mina, what about you? Um, yeah, I think my passion for investing started um, kind of similarly to Phil when, when I started working on Wall Street. At the time, I was learning a lot about companies, but also reading a lot um, on, on investing and particularly enjoyed the books by uh, Benjamin Graham. And that, uh, that passion uh, for investing that I had led me to join the fund management industry in 2007. That's another book that we haven't read. Yeah, <laughs> no, I don't know it. Um, and what does a typical day at work look like for both of you? Yeah, I'd say um, in some ways the, there are a number of uh, regular meetings that we have. So we have a nine o'clock morning meeting where we go through the news of the day, how that might affect what we're, we're thinking about our investments or, or what we might want to do next. Um, and then there are regular weekly updates on either the sectors we look at or the companies that we look at. And that's an opportunity for us to get together and just with a sort of cold towel on our foreheads, just sort of understand what's going on in a particular company or a particular area of the market. And, uh, and so there's a fair amount of prep that can uh, happen for those meetings. And then when the uh, timetable of the year is into reporting season, so where companies are reporting their results, that ramps up as, a, as an activity that we'll be looking at. And then we'll always try and get out on the road and see companies and go and visit them and really try and get under the skin of what drives them and why they're investing in their businesses the way they are. So in some ways, there's a there's a sort of rhythm to the to the year as to what's happening at different times. And in some ways, there's no typical day because lots of different things can happen. And if you're on the road seeing different companies, you can really have a, a light bulb moment at a time when you don't expect, which is which is really part of the fun. And uh, Mina, anything to add to that in terms of your typical day? Um, actually, very similar to Phil. Um, you know, I'd say we spend um, quite a bit of time um, doing research and valuation work on our companies, but also meeting with management teams and speaking to experts, uh, as well as discussing ideas amongst each other. And then we spend a fair amount of time on the road, uh, going on site visits and, and meeting with management uh, on, on site. Yeah, and one of the things we do a lot is we debate between ourselves what we think the company is like and, and what's a really good company and whether it's at, a, at an attractive valuation today. And, and I think one of the one of the fun parts of the job is that people will draw out different things from a, a, a piece of company analysis and actually be able to discuss it and debate it in a um, in, a, in a constructive way where we can add value to our funds is, is really part of the uh, part of the joy of the job. Mm. Well, one thing I've noticed since I joined the company is that whether the market is up or down, and we've seen a few sort of steep falls in the last few years, um, there's no sense of panic on the investment floor amongst the, the fund managers. Um, why is that? Is that just experience or it's just... A... I think it's partly, part, partly experience because you know that these things do go in, in cycles and partly that for the funds we run, we will remain fully invested in our asset class. So for the smaller company funds, we're going to be invested 100% in smaller companies. And if the client or our um, uh, managed funds, which do the asset allocation, want to reduce or increase their exposure to smaller companies, then they can do that. But we stay fully invested. So. So it actually removes one of the things that could be a big worry. You know, should we have more money in this uh, this this area of the market or should we not? Actually, we're 100% invested. So we'll definitely try and pick the right stocks that are going to get the best from a market environment. 
with a long-term view, but actually one of the big decisions is taken out of our hands. And I think that makes life easier. Now, has the industry changed since you first entered it? And again, a question for both of you. Maybe Mina, you could start. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the industry has certainly changed. I mean, on the one hand, what we've seen is, is growth of strategies that are seeking more short term, higher frequency trading, even quantitative trading type of strategies. On the other hand, and um, kind of what makes me happier is, is that we've also seen an emphasis on long-term investing. So things like sustainability factors are under more scrutiny today and um, responsible ownership is, is um, being emphasized. Um, then on a personal side, something dear to my heart, I think, is that the industry is now much more aware of uh, gender diversity. And I'm very pleased to see more female representation in fund management than it was the case 15 years ago. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's interesting. Those points about sustainability are uh, very much aligned with the way that we've always invested in our funds. So if you think that governance of a company and the way they run the business and the um, the ability for us as investors to ensure that they're not operating with uh, child labor in emerging markets, for example, or that the board structures are um, done in the best possible way. There's more visibility about those things, but also that should anyway allow the company to make better, more sustainable returns over the long term. So it very much fits in with the way we've always looked at companies. So, so that is definitely a good thing. Yeah. Um, one thing we always like to ask our guests, how often are you thinking about the end investor when you work? Every single day. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are also end investors in, in our funds and we manage our funds the way we would manage our own capital for our ch children and for our grandchildren. And that's how we think about funds. Yeah, absolutely. I've invested some money in my uh, children's junior ISIS uh, in the funds. And I made the mistake of telling my children that I'd done this uh, one day. <laughs> and, uh, and so now if I ask my kids to do something, they'll say, just remember, we're a client of yours and the client is always right <laughs> <laughs> very good no pressure no <laughs> okay moving on we're going to wrap up this segment uh, with a few rapid fire questions for you both i know you're really looking forward to this <laughs> section um so favorite books best book i read recently was uh, prisoners of geography uh, by tim marshall which is all about why uh, physical geography uh, has an impact on geopolitics and it takes a very long-term view on uh, why there are certain hotspots in the world and why there are new areas which are becoming more important, which I thought was just fascinating. Really interesting book. Um, for me, it's a more older read, but um, Man's Search for a Meaning by Austrian author Viktor Frank. Um, he chronicles his experience as a pr prisoner in, in concentration camps during World War II. And um, he concludes that the meaning of life is found in every moment of living. Uh, life never ceases to have meaning, even in suffering or death. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, what about films and TV shows? Have you got anything? To uh, the best film I watched recently was The Man From U.N.C.L.E., uh, which is a Guy Ritchie film from a few years ago. Yes. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Really, I thought really fun and stylish and very entertaining. Yep. Um, for me, uh, Woody Allen movies, uh, mm -hmm. I love them. I love his sense of humor. And also on the TV show side, uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm and oh, Scrubs yes. are Absolute two of my classic, favorites. Yeah. <laughs> um, moving on to bands, songs or albums, anything music related, what's, what's your favorites, Phil? Okay, so we spent a lot of time trying not to look too square on this. Um, <laughs> and, I, and my problem is that I think, I don't listen to a lot of music. I probably listen to the Today programme on Radio 4 more than anything else. <laughs> but I think if we talk about albums, I think the last time I was buying albums, it was Blur versus Oasis, oh, wow. uh, Battle of the Bands, and uh, so let's let's stick that down as um, uh, preferred. Well, who's, who, who won? Uh, for me, Blur. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Okay. I know, very controversial. <laughs> very good, very good. Mine? Bob Dylan and Rolling Stones. Oh, classics, oh, yeah. I think she's oh, outcooled you there. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Um, sports, favorite sports or sports teams do you play? Do you my, my favorite sport is tennis, so I'm a big fan of Federer. Oh, yeah. No surprise there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I play squash and I play golf, um, but my preferred uh, team to follow is the England cricket team. With all the joys and woes that that brings. <laughs> yeah, the Barmy Army. Yeah, I've never done that actually. That's something, you go, yeah, on the bucket list, I think. <laughs> yeah. um, and desert island food, what would you eat every day if you could? 
French wine and French cheese and maybe a baguette. Mm, <laughs> I'm getting a, a ferry to Mines Island. It sounds fantastic. Yeah, I think uh, lamb chops on the barbecue would be lovely. Ooh, yes. yeah. yeah, very good. Good choices. Um, have you got a hero? Who would your hero be? Professionally, I'd say Warren Buffett. And I, I don't. I'm not a great one for heroes, really. Um, and but I think one. I think all the all the sort of people who are polar explorers back in the day were were as mad as they were brave. <laughs> and uh, I read a book about Shackleton who. Um, basically brought his team back from a, an absolutely disastrous situation. But there was one bit where they were crossing um, several hundred miles of open water in freezing weather. And one of the guys looked up from this open boat and just said, oh, boss, I, I think the weather's clearing. And unfortunately, what he thought was a gap in the clouds turned out to be the crest of an enormous wave breaking over their boat. So so it's, when you read it, it's, it's remarkable that any of them survived. So I think, wow. um, yeah, we'd better stick him down. That sounds very inspiring. Right, and finally in this section, uh, what would you consider your greatest success success professionally or is there anything you would do differently if you could go back in time Phil I think launching my fund uh, back in uh, 2005 uh, which was a challenge at the time um, but I've been running it ever since so that in itself is is just been an amazing experience and a lot of fun um, and that went through the uh, global financial crisis as well so oh, we've wow. been we've been tested in all the uh, the ups and downs yes a big down there as well yeah <laughs> uh, Amino um, for me, I'd say probably where I am today, I'm very grateful and I'm very um, proud for how far I've come despite all the market headwinds and being you know, an investor uh, and a woman. Some interesting picks there, thank you. Right, it's time to take a step into the financial past to see what was happening in February throughout history. On February 11th, 1847, American inventor Thomas Edison was born in Ohio. Edison, of course, invented the incandescent bulb, phonograph and movie camera. And the 14th of February is, of course, Valentine's Day. In 2019, Valentine's Day shoppers added $20.7 billion to the US economy, according to the National Retail Federation, and only 51% of the US population celebrate it. Love is big business. On the 27th of February 2007, the Chinese stock bubble began when hundreds of billions of value was wiped from global stock markets due to rumours China was about to raise interest rates and outlaw speculative trading. Phil, you were a fund manager back in 2007 when the Chinese stock bubble happened. And of course, just a year later, the global financial crisis began. And what was it like managing money during that period? It felt uh, pretty extraordinary at times. The, uh, the moves in the market were breathtaking on occasion. And there were, you know, I remember the day that there were lines outside Northern Rock here in the UK. And that was a uh, you know, a run on a bank was something you read about in history books rather than actually saw on the streets of, of London. So I think that was, uh, was was a really extraordinary time. And then it sort of got worse in 2008 and then things started to get better in 2009. And I remember one a colleague at one point when things were really bad, you know, we were all sort of worried about what would happen next. And he just said things only had to get less bad for there to be something of a, of a recovery. And that was really helpful because it, it meant you could think about incremental changes rather than getting back to where we were before. And, mm. and so that was just a useful thing to think about, I think, when you were investing. Yeah, sort of, no, again, no helps not to panic as, <laughs> in those instances as well. And that kind of advice, I guess, is, is part of that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And Mina, you were an analyst at the time of the global financial crisis. What are your recollections of that period? They were testing times. We would come into the office and the stocks would be down 20% day after day, um, unprecedented for many investors active in, in, in those days. Um, it was a case in point for understanding market psychology and herd mentality. It reminds me of Warren Buffett's quote, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. Um, so it provided a huge investment opportunity for those that were solvent, uh, which um, wasn't uh, a lot. <laughs> for me, um, it was an invaluable learning experience. It taught me the importance of being patient, a long-term investor, being prudent with your capital and having conviction in your investment decisions. Now, before we finish, we're going to quickly look at three things you can ask your IFA this month. 
We're still relatively near the start of the year, which is always a good time to check your finances. And why not start with your pension? It's worth checking at least once a year whether your defined contribution pension is on schedule to produce the income you need at the point in time you intend to stop working. The firm that manages your pension may send you an annual statement setting out how much has increased in value over the previous 12 months, as well as what it might be worth by the time you reach retirement age. And while you're at it, if you have other stock market linked investments such as ISAs or individual savings accounts, you should also carry out a review to ensure they're performing adequately and that the risk levels are still appropriate to your circumstances. But don't panic. Just because an investment has underperformed doesn't mean you should necessarily cash it in. But equally, persistent underperformance against an appropriate benchmark can be a sign you need to make changes. Finally, check you're not being overcharged on your mortgage. Even though interest rates remain low in the UK, it is still worth checking you are not paying more than you need to on your home loan. If an initial two or five year deal has recently come to an end, for example, you may have been moved from a cheap fixed rate onto your lender's standard variable rate, which is typically a good deal more expensive. And as always with any financial planning or personal finances health check, do see an independent financial advisor if you're in any doubt. Well, that's about it for this episode. All that's left is to thank our guests, Phil and Mini. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks to my co-host for this episode, Mark King. You're very welcome. We'll be back next time when we'll have another fund manager to take on our 60-second challenge and talk us through their specialist field. If you have any questions or suggestions for the podcast, let us know at podcast at columbiathreadneedle.com. But until next time, thanks again for listening and goodbye. Important information. Your capital is at risk. Past performance is not a guide to future performance. The analysis included in this podcast has been produced by Columbia Threadneedle Investments for its own investment management activities. Information obtained from external sources is believed to be reliable, but its accuracy or completeness cannot be guaranteed. None of Columbia Threadneedle Investments, its directors, officers or employees make any representation, warranty guarantee or other assurance that any of these forward-looking statements will prove to be accurate. The mention of any specific shares or bonds should not be taken as a recommendation to deal. This podcast is not investment, legal, tax or accounting advice. Investors should consult with their own professional advisors for any advice. Issued by Threadneedle Asset Management Limited, registered in England and Wales, number 573204. Cannon Place, 78 Cannon Street, London, EC4N 6AG, authorised and regulated in the UK by the Financial Conduct Authority. Columbia Threadneedle Investments is the global brand name of the Columbia and Threadneedle Group of Companies.